Hello and welcome. I'm Richard Crispin. I'll be your moderator for today's session on America's superpower collaboration, how multi-stakeholder collaboration can unlock new possibilities tackling our world's biggest problems. I'm so grateful to be joined by a great panel of speakers. I have John Chang, the former treasurer of the state of California, Flory Lizer, the president of the Corporate Council on Africa, Demetrios Morantis, the senior vice president for Visa on global government engagement and a former US trade representative, Dustin McDaniel, the former attorney general for the state of Arkansas, and Connor Savoy, executive director of the Modernizing Foreign Assistance Network, Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our session today, and thank you all for being here with me uh, to take on our biggest challenges from pandemics to climate change to wealth and opportunity gaps. We need all hands on deck across business, government, and civil society. Yet the last four years saw a dramatic decrease in America's engagement in multilateral and multi-stakeholder collaboration, even as the need for it increased. Uh, what we want to explore today is how leaders incoming across the political spectrum and across civil, private, and public sectors can work better together on these tough problems, and how we as leaders might, including those listening in today, how we as leaders might jumpstart multi-stakeholder collaborations and see what we can learn from the past. Uh, Demetrios, you're the former acting U.S. Trade Representative and you now serve, as I said, as SVP of Global Engagement, Global Government Engagement and Visa. I want to start with you because as U.S. Trade Representative and now at Visa, you sit in a very interesting spot where government and business policy intersect. What's your advice for this incoming cadre of government and business leaders? And what can what can we see them do right now that would actually help move forward with collaboration? Yeah, I mean, I, the, the key issue, I think, for this administration is going to be how do you use trade policy, for example, as a tool for helping to get us out of the pandemic, get us out of, into an economic recovery. And so trade is going to be a lot more of a domestic policy issue than a foreign policy issue. And it's going to be one where I think we're going to have to work you know, with our partners and allies across the world in focusing on how to, as President Biden has said, build back better. And for me, that means really focusing on trying to jumpstart um, middle-class type trade policies. And the best way to do that, from my perspective, is focusing on small businesses. Small businesses are such a huge uh, employment generator. They're 90% of businesses. They're more than 50% of employment worldwide. They account for 95% of firms that export. So by by really focusing with our with our partners and allies around the world, in boosting small businesses, in helping them get online, in helping them trade digitally, I think that's going to be one of the key ways that that President Biden and his administration will be able to work with our partners and allies around the world in getting us out of the pandemic and really jumpstarting a global economic recovery. So if we want to jumpstart a global economic recovery, we need to open up trade. But trade policy is really more a domestic issue than it is an international one. Uh, and if we really want to break some of those deadlocks and get the politics working for us, uh, we need to look at how we can make trade uh, work for, for medium and small businesses. Do I have that right? You got it. And there's a lot that, that the U.S. can do with its partners, its trading partners around the world in the area of digital trade to really help jumpstart the ability of small businesses to, to get, become digitally enabled, to participate in the global trading system and thereby boost economic recovery in all participating economies. I wanna come back to that point, but before I do, I wanna, Flory, Flory Lizera, I wanna bring you in. You're the president of the Corporate Council on Africa. Um, you've heard from Demetrius, and I know you and Demetrius used to work together uh, about some of the ways in which we might you know, move forward with trade, but from where you're sitting, how how can um, the U.S. government, African governments, the African private sector uh, work better together and in, in, uh, in, in enhancing our relationships, including on trade and some of the issues that Demetrios raised? Great. Well, thank you. Um, and 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 basically, one of the things that I think is um, important and we don't hear a lot about is the importance of the African economy for U.S. businesses. Um, many U.S. businesses are in Africa, probably not as many as the Africans would like and not as many as we at Corporate Council on Africa would like as well. 
Um, but their story in terms of opportunities is a, a, a really um, significant one. And uh, with 55 countries and uh, an economy that's now um, uh, one large market, the largest uh, uh, free trade area in the world, um, the African continental free trade area, many U.S. companies recognize that there are opportunities there. And they are competing with companies from all over the world who are there from Europe and from uh China, people talk about China and Africa, but, um, you know, folks are there from Malaysia and Brazil and, um, you know, all around the world. Um, and I think that um, the point of collaboration, uh, to pick up on some of the things that Demetrius mentioned, is everyone is looking to uh, relaunch. Um, some are reinventing themselves in terms of, of their businesses. But uh, at this point, um, if we're not focused on collaboration, which is needed more than ever on um, fighting the pandemic, we still are in the midst of fighting the, uh, the COVID pandemic, um, but also um, the distribution of the vaccine, because Africa took a huge hit, both in terms of health, uh, not as bad as some areas of the world, including the United States, but the economic impact was uh, enormous. Um, you know, what happened to them in tourism, um, the decline in, in um, commodities prices, uh, it, you know, it's been an economic tsunami for them and they have not had the kind of um, uh, uh, capital infusions that other places like in Europe and the U.S. could have uh, to bring those economies back. So in order for U.S. businesses to be able to be back on the continent of Africa doing what they need to do and promoting their businesses uh, there, um, there's going to take a lot of collaboration that needs to happen on the vaccine rollout across Africa. And so um, we were really pleased uh, to see that the Biden administration has signaled positively uh, to Africa. The, the, there was a, it's just a little over two minutes, but uh, President Biden had a great message to the African Union Summit in January. Um, they've uh, donated four billion dollars to COVAX, which, you know, is the uh, the Gavi and World Health Organization um, 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 a group that's making sure that vaccine is spread out across the world and everybody can get access to it, not just the rich countries or the rich people. Um, and so those are really good signs already from this administration to show collaboration uh, with Africa and in support of what our businesses need. It's really not just for Africa and African businesses and African governments, but it really is supportive of um, uh, companies across the U.S. who have really uh, not been able to do the business they'd like to do in Africa. So if we can bring down the pandemic and what's ha and, and really help to reopen the African economy, that's going to be good for American businesses as Absolutely. well, because they can then relaunch and get back into those markets, both as buyers and sellers, uh, and, and, and it can take advantage of some of the opportunities that Demetrios laid out. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and great, great, great stuff. Um, John, uh, you're the former treasurer at state, the state of California, um, and you've really been at the forefront as treasurer of helping to pay for a lot of government response to crises. Uh, you know, what, what can we learn from our history or in our recent past and, as you're thinking about reopening the state of California and uh, facing down impending climate change and other things like that? From your role as the money man, what should we be thinking about? So we act to our detriment if we don't follow the lessons that Demetrios and Flory just pointed out. Uh, Demetrios used the term, I think, speed of trade. The uh, you know, the United States response was limited and unfortunately far too narrow to our institutional knowledge, our institutional history. Uh, the, the politicians like Dustin who have traveled elsewhere share great knowledge. If you travel to Taiwan, they will share their SARS experience. We didn't act upon that SARS knowledge. If we just look at the American experience, Samantha Powers and what we saw happen in Africa in regards to Ebola and the American response and America leading international co cooperation, uh, saying, hey, we need to take affirmative action to try to stop this. Uh, and so, un unfortunately, our critical responses, how we communicate after a disaster, how do we resettle people, how do we restructure economic activity, was far too narrow. It didn't, didn't recognize America's strength and greatness. Mm -hmm. So uh, we are we're sort of the prisoners of our own experience. And when we connect and collaborate with others, 
we get the benefit of their experience. And I, and I know from our own pandemic preparedness, most of it rotated off of the, the 19, uh, 14 flu. So we were looking for a flu-like virus, whereas, as you pointed out, in East Asian countries, they had the SARS-MERS experience, which is also a coronavirus type uh, virus. So they had a, a different kind of preparatory mindset. And if we'd been more open and more broad and not just taken advantage of the speed of trade issues that Demetrios mentioned, but the speed of knowledge, the speed of collaboration, we might have been able to get a better jump on the pandemic. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, perfectly uh, perfectly phrased and framed. The uh, You know, we have extraordinary diversity in the United States of America, people who bring their genius and created the, uh, you know, the world's greatest economic superpower in the history of humankind. And so you look at other responses, Taiwan, uh, Japan, uh, Singapore, Korea, the New Zealand, Germany, Iceland, uh, the, you know, a lot of those individuals who are leading those efforts were American trained. Uh, you know, we mm. we failed to build that bridge to share, continue to share that knowledge so that we could improve the quality of life and recovery for Americans. Mm, terrific. Um, so, Dustin, I want to bring you in here now. And uh, John is kind of pointing out the diversity of our country and the opportunity that we have to learn from all of the different past experiences that we all have but then we also need to reach out beyond our borders. Uh, but you're, you know, you're a former attorney general there in the state of Arkansas, and you're now the Democratic co-chair of the Society of Attorneys General Emeritus. Uh, and I know when we've spoken before, sort of the kryptonite on this collaboration superpower and the ability to tap into the things that Flory and John and, 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 and Demetrius have mentioned are, is tribalism and disinformation. Uh, and I know that that's something that attorneys general generally have seemed to be able to avoid, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on examples of collaboration for the 21st century and how, how governors and state's attorney general might, might move past that travelism and, and disinformation. Well, I would say that the states have done a pretty good job of resisting uh, some of the, we, we went from politics to partisanship to tribalism to hyper tribalism to uh, you know, I, I don't know exactly how you would describe some of the politics in Washington today, but the the states have done a relatively good job of, of focusing on simply governing um, and governors and attorneys general, especially uh, have had to look across state lines, uh, especially during during COVID. Uh, but AGs always have the attorneys general came together originally 1907 to form their association uh, to deal with either federal encroachment or uh, antitrust enforcement with which they're vested um, uh, concurrent authority uh, for enforcement with the uh, the federal government. We saw last year really significant action for the first time since Microsoft, uh, U.S. versus Microsoft, the states versus Microsoft, and before that, AT&T, um, to see the states uh, working together and collaboratively uh, across party lines, big states, rural states, high population, low, you know, everybody together signing on. And I'm not speaking to the judgment of whether these are meritorious uh, antitrust enforcement suits or whether it was a good idea or a bad idea. But uh, and then I think it's both. Um, but it was a really big deal to see that. What will happen this year? You know, um, this year is a redistricting year. Uh, the census is delayed because of COVID. Uh, when those numbers come out, each state does it differently in one way or another. But what we have seen is a trend in the United States over the last 40 years of politicians picking voters instead of voters picking politicians. And to those states that have chosen independent commissions to draw the lines, we're hopefully going to see um, less partisanship in the, the, uh, in, in, in the primary elections. For those states that have not, and I'm a reformed partisan line drawer when I was attorney general, that was one of my jobs. Uh, and I did it to the best of my ability. And, you know, I mean, that, that was just what was expected at the time. But when we continue to see, um, you know, the intra-party battles in primaries uh, punish uh, collaboration, punish uh, cooperation and compromise, that is a serious detriment to our democracy that is reaching the state levels. Mm. So wh I, what do we do about that? I mean, I, I hear you on the one hand that you know, local local elected officials have tended to be more cooperative and collaborative 
than national. And I, I even saw yesterday a, a news item on how Republican mayors were more open to, say, working with the Biden administration than have been uh, elected Republicans in, in Congress. But I, I forget who said that you get the government that you deserve. If voters continue to punish collaboration, are they not getting what they voted for? Is it? Well, again, primaries are a significant issue, and we're seeing reform in that regard. And look, I was on the Democratic National Committee for 11 years. Uh, you know, I was part of the Democratic Party structure for 20 years. Uh, I'm a proud Democrat and, and, and recognize the role that our parties play. But when we get to a point where facts don't matter anymore, then we've allowed uh, the role of, of, of party politics to, ta- to, supp- to take it, you know, the, the, the role of, of fact finding an actual government. And Oh, I'd love to vote for somebody who's more moderate. Gosh, I really would like to vote for somebody in the middle. I'm generally a Republican, but I'm not of this particular extreme wing, or I'm generally a Democrat, but I'm not of the the ultra left uh, persuasion. Though those decisions are made for them by the party, uh, you know, by the partisan primary process before it ever gets to them. So we're starting to see states. Um, like California, uh, like Louisiana, like like several others, even Arkansas is considering uh, letting the the the, the uh, you know the the, the top two uh, vote getters advance to a general election, and they may very well be of the same party. Uh, we're going to have to find ways to where you elect people who actually want to govern, because those mayors are perfectly fine to take the money from the Biden administration because they don't see the money as evil because it keeps their their street departments and their fire departments and their tra- you know, the trash uh, trucks running. It's very easy right. to say, I don't care how bad that breaks down if all I care about is the ideology. Mm-hmm. So that's why I say that, 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 that hyper-partisanship is kryptonite to collaboration. Yeah, no, yeah. So, uh, Connor, I want to bring you into this conversation. Connor, you're the executive director at the Modernizing Foreign Aid uh, Network, and uh, I think you've heard from uh, you know, kind of across the spectrum here, both from at the hyper local level as well as the international level, that uh, we need America to show up uh, and we need Americans to show up in, in collaboration with others. And the pandemic, I think, has really underlined the importance of America's vital role. Um, what should we learn from the last four years uh, and how should that inform the next four years and the next 40 years for that matter? Thanks, Richard. This is a great conversation, and there's been a lot of great comments already. And I, I think I'd be very blunt: we we can't do it alone. Um, I think your abs- the 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 framing of this around collaboration is absolutely correct. And I think the COVID nineteen pandemic, I hope more than anything else, has driven home this idea that that we we have to be engaged and we have to collaborate with others in this world. Um, most often they should be our friends and our allies and our like-minded partners. But when you're confronting uh, a crisis like a, co- like a pandemic, which does not respect borders, you're, you are really going to have to look to work with everyone. And sometimes it's going to be people that you may not trust fully. Um, and it, it, but, but absent that, absent that um, you get what, what we've seen um, and it has not been uh, a successful response. Um, and it's not just about not going it alone. It's about being at the table. Um, and the last four years have really shown that we need to be, that the United States still needs to be at the table. The largest economy in the world, the strongest military, the largest foreign assistance budget. Um, we need to be there. And in, in this, in especially at the, in these multilateral institutions, um, the WHO is a really good example of this. Um, you know, in the midst of a global pandemic, we made the decision that we would withdraw from the WHO. Um, this isn't to absolve the WHO. Um, it has its problems that needs to be reformed. Um, the previous administration, the Obama administration, recognized that during the Ebola outbreak in West Africa and the subsequent Zika outbreak in uh, South America. Um, but we need to be there. We can't just pick up our ball and go home. 
we're not at the table. We can't drive the reforms that we want to see. Um, and I, I and I'm pleased to see that the Biden Harris administration um, rejoined the WHO or made the announcement that we would rejoin the WHO on day one. And they're reengaging with the world, and that's what we have to do um, uh, to solve these challenges. So we have to re-engage, we have to be there, we have to participate in these, in these uh, institutions. Uh, I, I've also seen, I wonder, do you, do you feel like we've lost an opportunity here? I mean, I see China making r really big noises about it, what I'll call its vaccine diplomacy, what, you know, in terms of its offering of the vaccine. Flory mentioned that you know, the Biden-Harris administration has said it will contribute to COVAX. But I feel like that's getting, you know, maybe third page news, whereas the China contribution, the Chinese contribution is getting front page news. Uh, what, what, how do we how do we make up for the lost time here? Yeah, I mean, Richard, you make a very good point. I mean, let's be honest, if there's a vacuum, someone will fill it. And the Chinese are more than willing to fill it. And they have shown that with the COVID crisis, they've shown that with trade, they have shown that with economic investment in Africa um, and really around the world. Um, we, we need to make up for lost time. Uh, our, our initial uh, contributions to COVAX are a great first step, but we need to do so much more. Um, mm -hmm. The Biden-Harris administration needs to really look at the tools we have, diplomatic tools, the foreign assistance tools, trade tools, our economic tools, and really think about what do we need to do to bring these all together to offer something else. And, 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 I, and I'm truly one of those people who believes that there is a competition with China. It won't always be competition. There will be areas where we may be able to find cooperation, but we should offer something else. And I think our offer is better. Um, but if we're not out there, if we're not presenting it, if we're not working together collaboratively um, across party lines, then we're, we're going to be presenting the world with a weak hand. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and that's not what's needed at this time, uh, at this moment in time. Demetrius, I want to take it back to you. I mean, you know, Connor said we, we do need to make up for lost time. And he mentioned that the United States is, you know, the largest economy in the world. We're also the largest uh, foreign aid um, contributor in the world. But I know many developing countries would prefer to have a trade relationship with the United States, not an aid relationship. And I feel like you, you mentioned digital trade and the importance of it to the economic recovery, and in particular, the importance of it to small and medium-sized businesses uh, and women-owned businesses. Can you say a little bit more about, like, kind of practically speaking, what do we need to do to kind of close that digital divide, bring this digital trade uh, to these small businesses and women-led firms so that we can really jumpstart the economy and uh, put in place the kind of practical things that we need to make that all happen? Richard, it's an amazing opportunity for the United States to lead. Small businesses are the backbone of the local economy. They're the backbone of the national economy. They're the backbone of the global economy. We know that connecting small businesses to trade increases their revenue. We know that increasing small businesses to the global marketplace helps them improve their business management, build more competitive business, and allows them to employ more people. So why not focus on agreements that the United States can lead that can help small businesses and help the global and national economies at the same time? Digital trade agreements do that. Small businesses that are not digitally enabled are the ones that are suffering the most. They're the ones that are having the most trouble recovering from the pandemic. Small businesses that are digitally enabled are statistically shown to have larger monthly revenue more customers and have customers that are actually paying them more. So if we can get small businesses connected through agreements that help promote cross-border data flows, through agreements that help eliminate um, um, problems and inefficiencies like data localization, that's the way to go. We have partners and friends in Asia who have been doing that. Singapore and Australia have concluded an amazing digital economy agreement that allows for cross-border data flows, it prohibits data localization, it allows for cooperation in areas like AI, privacy, um, and other areas that are really going to be the backbone of the digital economy. So let's do that. It's not politically costly, and the impact is really significant. So when you say digital trade agreement, is, is that example you just gave of like the Australia-Japan, is that what you mean? 
Yeah, there's a lot of work in Asia, uh, in Asia and Southeast Asia, um, on these digital economy agreements, and they're really good. Um, and mm -hmm. there's a, a blueprint there that the United States can work with in really helping to mold um, this, not just on a bilateral basis, but this could be a way of reinvigorating the WTO. You know, going back to Flory's point about Africa, how many businesses in Africa are, are small and micro and women-owned? Initiatives like this are going to make a huge difference for U.S. trade with Africa. So let's start there. Let's start where we know it's going to work and then build upon that. Um, let me ask you, I want you, I want Demetrius, I want you to help me put John and Dustin on the spot here. So you just mentioned what you need from like the WTO and from trade agreements. But what are the kinds of things that you would need from, for, to enable a better digital infrastructure locally, like within the states? When we were talking before the session started to Dustin, he's got great rural broadband. I don't. I don't have in, in, in the Commonwealth of Virginia. We don't have great rural broadband. What, what, what would be needed? What kinds of policies do you need at the state and local level? I mean, Richard, that kind of this is, I love putting people on the spot, but <laughs> this is an, it, this is a great question because no one company, no one government, no one entity can do this on its own. This has to be a, 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 a private public partnership type of thing because there are areas where, where individual entities have their own expertise. At Visa, we're great at digital payments. We're great at enabling small businesses. We have a, you know, a $200 million grant that the Visa Foundation has made recently that's really focusing on women-owned small and micro enterprises. That's great, but Visa can't solve this problem alone. We need to work with national governments. We need to work with state and local governments on policies that help promote digital equity, on policies that help promote digital trade, and on policies that help promote digital commerce. And there's a, there's a place for everyone. Um, and there are a lot of good initiatives out there USAID has the E-Trade Alliance, which has been really significant um, in terms of helping small and micro entrepreneurs in Africa, in Asia, and in Latin America. Um, there's state and local initiatives underway. I mean, there's a lot of room for everybody to come to the party and play and really make a difference here. Awesome. So I'm going to go to John and Dustin next to hear about their kind of views on what Demetrius just said. I'm also going to queue it up for you. Flory, I'm going to come to you and ask you about digital equity and how we can promote digital equity uh, between Africa and the United States. And then, Connor, I'm going to come back to you to talk about the E-Trade Alliance and what USAID is doing on that. But, John, first to you, uh, you know, Demetrius laid out we need sort of this public-private collaboration and we need it at the state and local level. I'm also imagining as a former treasurer, you know, digital payments probably increases the improves the ability of states to collect taxes. Um, you're there at the home of Silicon Valley. And what, what do you think needs to be done in California, but also across local states to, to realize this vision? Or if I guess maybe do you agree with Demetrios's vision, first of all? And if so, what do we need to do to bring it about? Yeah, I strongly concur with uh, Demetrios's comments. Yeah. So specifically in regards to digital access, broadband access, right? There's two fronts that you need public private partnership. You need, the, the, you need the deployment for the infrastructure. And se secondly, you have to work on pricing. Uh, so the, we're having parties not only in California, but nationally come together to address those issues. Uh, when you're talking about uh, Dustin so appropriately framing it, right, in his eastern Arkansas community that he has that access, uh, when the North Dakota Superintendent of Public Instruction, I'm not sure that's her title, talks about the 99% of North Dakota uh, having that broadband access when they started pre-pandemic with 80% access, right? They had a model in place. Uh, we need to have models in place that represent uh, and reflect the values of local communities, uh, bringing all those parties together. Uh, the What Flory mentioned, uh, Ch China has engaged, right, and Richard, you alluded to it, not the term, but the, the they have the, uh, was it the Belt and Road Infrastructure Program, right, where they tied in Africa, the essential minerals, uh, the United States can be much more generous, right? The, the, the Chinese have been helpful to Africa, but now there's onerous debt terms that a lot of African countries are going to, and local governments are going to have problems uh, meeting up on, on those debt payments. Uh, and part of that is you talked about the, uh, and uh, Demetrius talked a lot about is the digitization. The United States of America is way behind the Asian countries. Just part of it is numbers, but part, part of it is adaptation, right? 
our monetary dominance for a long time has held us back on the digital uh, uh, finance, monetary, and fintech developments. The, uh, and you can easily understand why people from lower income countries, those that are subject to uh, massive uh, currency valuations, are looking to some type of stablecoin cryptocurrency, uh, not subject to the whims of currency uh, fluctuations from their native currency and other international currencies. So with Visa and others, uh, the communities, a lot of the local grassroots activities, the United States, we're hearing better comments recently, uh, members of the Biden administration, but we really fell behind on developing on that front. And the Chinese who have been trying to write surpass the United States or by the bypass the United States on using monetary policy, having some type of cryptocurrency, especially engaged in their trade, have been very astute over the past few years. The United States needs to catch up in that area. So the next time you see Governor Newsom, what are you going to tell him? What, what should he do to help improve collaboration and, and digital infrastructure there in the state? The uh, the legislature, I just got off a call right before this. The uh, I co-chair California Forward, so we're, we're a nonprofit organization that works with the Newsom administration, policymakers, the business community, trying to work on broadband policy. The, uh, right, and part of this is, as North Dakota adequately framed it, right, because you'll have a divide between progressives and conservatives. The, and they'll talk about... There is an economic upside, not a, uh, and improvement of quality of life of the individuals. Right? And you can't continue to mm-hmm. have that health divide between people of communities, between people of different generations. They need the healthcare access. They need the educational access. This help, helps grow the quality of lives for every single American. Mm-hmm. Thank you. No, that's that's great. Thanks, John. Dustin, uh, you know, Dim- again, Demetrios's vision there. Uh, I think also requires some perhaps changes in law, also the way those laws are enforced. That's uh, part of the attorney's general uh, mandate here. So w- A, do you agree with Demetrius's vision and what John just said uh, in terms of needing digital policies and needing sort of a proactive approach on that? And if so, how does that, how do you see that playing out in the courts and, and what would be required from attorneys general? Well, I do agree with them. And I think that uh, some real opportunities uh, are at our doorstep. Uh, so the, American Recovery Act has got uh, hundreds of billions of dollars going out directly to states. Uh, Our uh, governor and legislature uh, have already said we need to uh, focus a good chunk of that money into uh, uh, broadband access, not just uh, in rural parts of of the state and out in the country where the uh, population is so uh, spread out as to really substantially per customer increase the infrastructure cost, but also in low-income urban neighborhoods, uh, in areas that have been traditionally underserved in our communities, that uh, the concentration of people is there. Uh, however, the uh, the profitability of the investment uh, in running the infrastructure has not been there. And we have not treated broadband as a utility, but we have allowed it to be uh, run essentially uh, by, you know, by some utilities, by by regulated uh, companies. But it is like a utility. Uh, At this point, uh, we need to have comprehensive policy that crosses state lines to make sure that everyone has, you know, access to uh, steady power and steady uh, uh, high speed uh, broadband because your ability to educate your children, no one predicted that that would be become uh, the decisive factor of 2020, but you either had internet in your home or in your apartment or you didn't. If you didn't, uh, not only were your children deprived of a year's worth of social interaction and all of the things that we're going to be talking about and social scientists will be studying uh, about the lost year of public education uh, for, uh, for 2020, but also how are they supposed to, to function? And mom and dad, uh, amazingly enough, were in, in, you know, not amazingly enough, predictably enough, uh, the households that were able to work from home 
uh, were in that socioeconomic demographic that was able uh, to, to already have good uh, connectivity. Those that couldn't and had to go to work and had to go and, and be essential and face uh, the pandemic were often leaving kids not going to school without uh, access to, to nutritious uh, school meals and then also without uh, adequate broadband. So I'm hoping that what we're going to see are companies, the National Governors Association, especially uh, National Conference of State Legislatures uh, coming together to think about how do we invest in this? Because you just there was no way for President Eisenhower to know what was going to come from the national, uh, you know, building a national interstate system. But clearly it changed mm -hmm. our lives, our national defense, our economies, everything. People moved to where the highways went and the highways transported businesses to where people didn't used to be. And that's exactly what we're going to see by making sure that we modernize connectivity, regardless of wealth and regardless of, of whether you live in rural or urban settings. Mm, yeah. Uh, so same question to you. I mean, if, when you go back to Bentonville and you see uh, Governor Hutchinson, what are you going to tell him? What, what, what should he do? Well, I support what he's doing right now. I think he's done a tremendous job of balancing Arkansas's economy, our, our, our Department of Health, and uh, really expediting uh, getting shots into arms. I got my second shot uh, two, uh, two days ago, so very excited about that. Very excited about that. Uh, so I think Governor Hutchinson has truly been doing the Lord's work uh, with, with uh, major anchors, uh, you know, that he's having to drag behind him. Um, I think that... It's going to be key to to do what he wants to do on 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 broadband, but don't discriminate. Uh, and I don't think he will. I think he's got a, a good grasp on this. Uh, rural versus urban communities of color, uh, uh, socioeconomic disparate, but even even higher income areas uh, that that lo and behold happen to be a new newly developed subdivision five miles outside of town that nobody's bothered to take the the higher the, the, the higher speed internet too. I mean, those are those are going to be key. And then, of course, I hope that the governors come together and really uh, uh, work to pressure Congress and support Congress in comprehensive infrastructure investment because it's going to take Democrats and Republicans. Nobody cares if a runway right. in a city you know is crumbling because the their co member of Congress is part of the Freedom Caucus or not. All they care about is. We can't recruit business to town if we can't land an airplane at what used to be a 5,000 foot runway that worked and now it's not. Great, but thanks. Um, now, Flora, I want to come to you and I specifically, I want to talk about this issue of, uh, of digital equity that, that Demetrios mm -hmm. raised. So uh, how, how do we promote digital equity and, and tra I guess also, you know, economic, more, greater, uh, greater equity in, in economic opportunity and economic development, perhaps powered by digital equity? So, you know, this is it's so interesting because the digital equity discussion that we're having about what's happening in the United States, the kind of communities that have access to the Internet um, and thereby able to have um, uh, digital learning, e-health, um, et cetera, um, are some of the same things we see on another level in terms of Africa. What's happened to them uh, where uh, in many areas they don't have access to the Internet, connectivity rates are low, then um, children lost an entire year of, of learning. Um, people were not able to um, access uh, telehealth in the same ways that many of us are, are doing now. You know, you have a, an appointment with your doctor um, uh, over the Internet. Um, and so these issues, I think the thing that I think is interesting and CCA would love to support is the ways that we can work with the institutions here in the U.S., whether it's the Development Finance Corporation um, or um, the U.S. Trade and Development Agency or USAID or Department of Commerce or USTR to actually promote trade between uh, going to, to Demetrius's point, small uh, uh, and medium-sized enterprises here in the U.S., minority-owned, women-owned, uh, diaspora-owned, and linking them to partners of theirs on the continent who are also small youth uh, entrepreneurs, women entrepreneurs, um, are driving a lot of the growth in Africa as well. Mm -hmm. And if we see the link between the digital equity here and digital equity there, 
as allowing for more economic equity, not only here in the United States, who benefits from trade, um, but who uh, can also benefit in the global economy. And Africa, I think, is well poised. Their, their um, access to the internet has actually been growing in multiples of what you see in other areas, but it's because they started from such a low base. Um, but their, their growth rate is, 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 is really taking off. And, and the last thing that I would say is that, um, again, because of the pandemic, what we're seeing also are the breakdown in supply chains. We saw it here in the U.S. We certainly saw it. Um, you know, across the globe and in Africa. And here's where, you know, what are the opportunities for small businesses that have not been a part of these um, larger uh, regional and global supply chains to get a piece of the action and get pulled in so that they can be the suppliers of, of, um, of goods and services that the, the whole world needs and that for the next coronavirus that hits us, we now have a more diversified um, uh, 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 supply chain um, with lots more people, especially small businesses here and our smaller partners around the world, including in Africa, being a part of that. And we are seeing African companies that are um, starting to build uh, ventilators, not the same kind we have here that cost you know, tens of thousands, um, but, but uh, uh, ventilators that will work just fine. Um, uh, looking to produce some of the vaccine on the continent. Um, many of the co uh, countries in Africa also found that um, it was small pharmaceuticals, um, drug stores as we would call them in the past, that were able to actually get up to speed in COVID testing far quicker than you know the hospitals and the clinics that were on the ground there, which really did not have the capacity. So again, it's small businesses, um, small entrepreneurs who are able to step into the market and provide what's needed, especially um, in these times. And I think yeah. here in the U.S., we're ripe for a time where we can see, um, you know, more economic equity across a wider range of groups. Yeah. So if we can get these small businesses connected, they can become a real voice for uh, for, for creating new opportunity of being much more both diverse in the way that, um, that John mentioned, as well as uh, to help be examples of resilience and flexibility in the face of crisis. Absolutely. Excellent. And the institutions, um, we have yeah. to support that here. I think that's important as well. We've got about three minutes left, but I want to hear, Connor, I do want to hear a couple words from you on the E-Trade Alliance. And then I'm going to do a lightning round with everybody. I want to hear one takeaway, one thing you think our audience members can go and do to help realize some of this, the, 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 the vision that we've heard. So, Connor, over to you, E-Trade Alliance. Yeah, so I don't know a lot of the, all the details in the E-Trade Alliance, but here's what I'll say. I think this is very much, it's a good example of the way in which we should be putting, putting forward to the world. Um, we've talked about, John mentioned the Belt and Road Initiative that China are doing. This is this is structured as large state to state loans to finance infrastructure. It's often financed with promises of access, preferential access to minerals. But what we can offer and Flory mentioned the International Development Finance Corporation and Development Agency. What we can offer is something different. And I think the E-Trade Alliance is a really good example of the work that AID does on this. But the bringing our entrepreneurial spirit, bringing our private sector there um, to help solve a lot of the challenges and to enable the economic growth um, in these countries that will not only be beneficial for them, but also for us in the long run um, as we build a deeper trade and economic relationship. Because as you pointed out before, most of these countries want to transition away from an aid relationship. That's not what they want. What they want is a trade and economic relationship with us. And I think by accessing our private sector, by accessing that entrepreneurial spirit, that'll help get them there. Awesome. Thanks, Connor. Okay, lightning round real quick. One thing our audience members can go and do. John, you first. Uh, model best behavior and advocate aggressively. Model best behavior. Awesome. Flory. Um, I'd like to put a plug for people to support another U.S. Africa Leaders Summit. President Obama started that. We've only had one. Other, other uh, countries around the world meet with African heads of state um, regularly. Um, and, you know, the U.S. should be doing the same. So if they can go out and support that, that's a, the best way to promote collaboration between the United States and the countries of Africa to do it at the highest level. 
highest level U.S. African Leaders Summit. Dustin, your turn. Increase your engagement with your state and local elected officials. Uh, there are there are public and private partnerships to be had and pragmatism to be found. Terrific, uh, Connor. Uh, be an advocate for U.S. global engagement. Uh, don't see it as simply an elite by coastal discussion, but one that's as important to the people of Little Rock, Arkansas, as it is to me here in Washington, D.C., or John and Demetrius in California. Uh, advocate for it. It's important. Absolutely. Engage and advocate. Uh, and uh, Demetrius, last word. Get on your phone or get on your computer, get on a website and buy something from your favorite small business. Love it. I'm going to do that as soon as we get off the line here. Um, ladies and gentlemen, this has been a terrific conversation. I really appreciate uh, the contributions from uh, from John Chang, from Flore Lizaire, from Demetrius Marantis, from Dustin McDaniel.